post-truth. Now, that's not a new word that I've just made up. In 2016, post-truth was declared the international word of the year by Oxford Dictionaries. Another term that we may be more familiar with is fake news. This term has been used for well over 100 years, but uh, undoubtedly it has become much more common in the last decade. The renewed popularity of fake news in our culture is a prime example of the post-truth society we now live in. A simple Google search will bring you to websites that contain fabricated stories and false claims. These stories are often shared thousands of times on social media. Fake news, as well as being misleading, can have damaging implications on individuals and society in general. Misinformation, however, is not just a 21st century phenomenon. It has always been around. This morning I'm going to attempt to correct some misinformation that has subtly developed over the last century or so. This misinformation is about a man who walked on this earth 2,000 years ago. His name, Jesus Christ. One current popular perception of Jesus, uh, which is magnified each Christmas, is that he was a man of love who came to bring peace. His message was peace between men on earth through love. Now, you may be sitting here this morning or watching online and saying, well, that's correct, isn't it? Surely this is scriptural. That statement could never be fake news. You may point me to certain portions of Scripture. The prophet Isaiah in chapter 9, a very common reading at Christmas carol services, a messianic prophecy, verses 6 and 7. For unto us a child is born, unto us a son is given, and the government will be upon his shoulder. And his name will be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. Of the increase of his government and peace, there will be no end. To back this up, you might direct me to other portions of Scripture. The portion in Luke where uh, the angels appear to the shepherds proclaiming Christ's birth. Luke chapter 2, verses 13 and 14. And suddenly there was with the angel a multitude of the heavenly host praising God and saying, Glory to God in the highest, and on earth peace, goodwill toward men. Jesus himself also talked about peace. In John chapter 14, verse 27, Jesus speaking, saying, Peace I leave with you. My peace I give to you. Not as the world gives do I give to you. The Apostle Paul speaks of Jesus when uh, he writes in the letter to the Ephesians, chapter 2, verse 17. And Paul is writing, And he, he's speaking of Jesus, and Jesus came and preached peace to those who were far off. He's talking about the Gentiles and peace uh, to those who were near, talking about the Jews. The word peace is associated with Jesus so many times in Scripture. Surely we should expect from these passages alone that Jesus did come to bring peace to this world. Yes, he did but not in the way a lot of people think. And we'll deal with the correct interpretation later. The Bible also tells us that Jesus came to give life, to give light, and to save sinners. Now, these statements are definitely correct, but this is only one side of Jesus. 
If we want a fuller picture, if we ever want to meet the real Jesus, not a fake news version, it would be a benefit to also look at what one commentator described as the cumbersome and stormy north side of Jesus. And we're going to take a glimpse at this this morning. Uh, there's no way we have time this morning uh, to look uh, at the full character of Jesus, but we're going to take a, a look, a glimpse at this this morning. So the passage we're going to look at is from Luke's Gospel. Luke's Gospel, chapter 12. And I'm going to read verses 49 to 53. So Luke chapter 12, and beginning at verse 49. And this is Jesus speaking. I came to send fire on the earth, and how I wish it were already kindled. But I have a baptism to be baptized with, and how distressed or straitened I am till it is accomplished. Do you suppose that I came to give peace on earth? I tell you, not at all, but rather division. From now on, five in one house will be divided, three against two and two against three. Father will be divided against son and son against father. Mother against daughter and daughter against mother. Mother-in-law against her daughter-in-law, and daughter-in-law against her mother-in-law. Amen. In this passage, Jesus clearly explains three things that he came to do. Number one, he came to cast fire on the earth. Number two, he came to undergo a baptism that distressed him, we could say throughout his earthly ministry, if not his entire life. But most shocking of all, Jesus said he came to bring division. I wonder if someone had asked you during the week, could you tell me why Jesus came to this earth? Would you have included any of these options in your answer? Maybe these three statements have surprised or even shocked you. You're probably saying to yourself, this doesn't sound like the meek and mild Jesus I was taught about in Sunday school. A Jesus who came to cast fire on this earth? A Jesus who was continually distressed about a baptism, whatever that means, and who was to bring division. This isn't the Jesus we're told about each Christmas, a Jesus who, through love, is going to bring peace between men on earth. If you're surprised by this passage in Luke 12, I would imagine the, the Jewish audience listening to Jesus would have been equally, if not even more, shocked. They wanted a Jesus to fit into their expectations, their expectations of what the coming Messiah would be like. Certainly not what Jesus was saying. But all these statements came from the lips of Jesus. And to get a better picture of the real Jesus, it is necessary to study them. So what does this all mean? Verse 49, I came to send fire on the earth. Jesus says he's come to send fire. Now, fire can be a picture of judgment. The Bible tells us that when Jesus returns in the second coming, it will be as a judge, and he will be responsible for implementing a second global judgment of the whole earth with fire. 
Now, if you're sitting here or watching and wondering, well, what was the first global judgment? Well, that wasn't with fire. It was with water. And we read about that in the Old Testament, the global flood in the days of Noah. But many commentators would say that Jesus is not talking here about the second judgment. He's talking about something that will happen connected to his first coming. It is the fire of the gospel. Now, the Bible does describe God's Word like a fire, and we read about that in Jeremiah chapter 23, verse 29. The gospel message in God's Word is like a fire sent upon the earth. In particular, its spreading power and its life-changing effects wherever it goes. Fire, as well as being a destructive force, can also be used to purify. Precious metals such as silver or gold are refined or purified with fire. To those who believe and accept the gospel message, they will be purified. But to those who reject the fire of the gospel, the Bible says they will eventually be consumed. But Jesus said, I came to send fire on the earth, and how I wish, how I wish it were already kindled. Jesus is longing for this fire to be lit and then sent out. And to fully understand this, we need to look at verse 50. So, verse 50, but I have a baptism to be baptized with. And how distressed, if you're reading King James Version, it says straightened, straightened or distressed. How distressed I am till it is accomplished. I have a baptism to be baptized with. It's not a water baptism because that had already happened. It's not a baptism of the Spirit that was already received. Jesus was talking about a baptism or immersion into pain and suffering. A baptism of judgment that was to come at the cross. A baptism of Jesus with God's wrath. A baptism unto death itself, a baptism that was part of the plan of salvation. Jesus, in verse 50, is anticipating his death and suffering on the cross and was distressed until it was carried out. Jesus is distressed about the crucifixion to come, and it explains him looking forward to the fire of the gospel being cast out on earth, as described in verse 49. You see, there's no good news story of the gospel, no fire to be sent out. There's no good news story of the gospel to be told until the final part of God's salvation plan had been carried out. And that's only after the crucifixion, and resurrection of Jesus. The fire of the gospel was kindled or lit at the crucifixion. If the fire of the gospel is being cast out, that means the suffering of Jesus at the crucifixion will be over. Now for the third and perhaps most shocking statement from Jesus in this passage of why he came. Jesus came to bring division. Verse 51, do you suppose that I came to give peace on earth? I tell you, not at all, but rather division. Now, this seems to be in direct contradiction of what we read earlier in the book of the prophet Isaiah. One name Isaiah gives Jesus is the Prince of Peace. 
Jesus said in John's gospel, as we read earlier, peace I leave with you. Paul stated in the letter to the Ephesians that Jesus preached peace to both Gentiles and Jews. But Jesus says in Luke 12, verse 51, he came to bring division. How do we square this circle? How do we get round these seemingly contradictory statements? The Jewish audience listening to Jesus also had issues with this statement. Do you suppose that I came to give peace on earth? I tell you, not at all, but rather division. What a shattering statement. What a shattering statement for Jesus to make to his listeners. The Jews had, at this time, had an expectation that when the Messiah would come, there would be a great period of peace, nationwide peace. Their Messiah would be a great military leader, something akin to King David from the Old Testament. The occupying Roman forces would be defeated in their mind, and Israel would once more be restored as a powerful, self-ruling, and peaceful nation. But Jesus says no. His coming will not bring peace, but rather division. Do you suppose that I came to give peace on earth? I tell you, not at all. This is not a contradiction. Of course Jesus came to bring peace. It's the peace primarily between man and God. In Romans 5, verse 1, we read, Therefore, having been justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. The Bible tells us that in the unsaved state, we are at enmity or opposition to God. If we're unsaved, we're off the world. We love the world and what it has to offer more than we love God. The epistle of James chapter 4 verse 4 says, you adulterous people, and he's talking about spiritual adultery, people going after the, the gods of this world and materialism or whatever, you adulterous people, you do, do you not know that friendship with the world is enmity with God. Therefore, whoever wishes to be a friend of the world makes himself an enemy of God. So, how was peace between man and God accomplished? Paul's letter to the Romans again, chapter 4, verse 25. Who, and Paul is talking about Jesus who was delivered for our offenses and was raised again for our justification. That's quite quite a big term, that, justification. What is justification? Well, justification is to declare someone righteous or to make one right with God. Everyone has sinned and deserves eternal punishment in hell. Justification is only possible because someone else took the punishment we deserved. It has been rightly deserved as as a legal term. That someone was Jesus who was delivered for our offenses. Jesus Christ paid the fine for our sins when he was crucified on Calvary. Justification is declaring those who receive Christ as their Savior righteous. They are now innocent in God's eyes. I remember Harry giving a a really good, straightforward, simple to understand definition of justification. I'm going to give you that to you now. Justification. God treats a saved person 
the way he should treat the sinless and perfect Jesus. If you're saved, God treats you as if you're sinless and perfect like Jesus. But why can God do this? Because God treated Jesus through his crucifixion and death the way he should have treated us, because that's what we deserve. The sin debt we owed God, the fine for our sins, was paid by Jesus at Calvary. This is the message of peace, the peace between man and God. This is the good news of the gospel. The gospel is not a message of division. It's a message of reconciliation. Reconciliation between man and God. If you're listening this morning and you are unsaved, the Bible says you're separated from God because of your sin. You're an enemy of God, and you need to get reconciled with God. But what does Jesus mean when he says, I came to bring division? The gospel does bring peace whenever it is believed and received. Unfortunately, it's not received by all people. The effect of preaching the gospel can result in division. The gospel itself is not to blame. It's the heart of man, a hard, self-righteous heart. A brief read through early church history will tell you of family members being given up to authorities to be brutally tortured and executed because of their faith. And this is still happening today. There's currently severe persecution of Christians in many countries which are predominantly Muslim. Hate crimes against Christians in India, which is predominantly Hindu, rose by 40% in 2020. Intense pressure is being placed on Christians in communist China. And North Korea still tops the list as the country where it's most difficult to follow Jesus. But Jesus specifically talked about division within a family unit. From now on, five in one house will be divided, three against two and two against three. Father will be divided against son and son against father, mother against daughter and daughter against mother, mother-in-law against her daughter-in-law and daughter-in-law against her mother-in-law. The gospel has divided families right down the middle. A teenager from a Muslim family in Nigeria gets saved by listening to Christian podcasts. He's beaten by his father and, and threatened with being uh, reported to the religious authorities. But then you don't have to go to countries where there's persecution of Christians to see division in families. Children have been saved at Christian summer camps in Northern Ireland, and there's nothing but opposition from their parents. Why? Why do you keep going on about this saved business? Parents, after attending a week of mission services organized by a neighboring church, they get saved, and they're despised by their teenage children. Here's a sad fact. It's an exception that all members of a family under the same roof are saved. Gospel preaching divides. How dare you call me a sinner? Jesus saw that the gospel would cause division. It's not Jesus' goal. It wasn't his goal, but an inevitable fact if some are saved and others are not. 
If someone believes and receives the gospel, it brings peace between them and God. But the effect of preaching the gospel results in division, as not everyone will be saved. Being a Christian is not a bed of roses. Jesus said in John 16, verse 33, These things I've spoken unto you, that in me ye might have peace. In the world ye shall have tribulation or trouble. But be of good cheer. I have overcome the world. To describe Jesus as the great divider doesn't sound like the Jesus many of you think about, but it's true. If you accept him as your savior, he will bring peace between you and God. He will be your prince of peace. There will, however, be division with unsaved friends, family members, and the world. But you will possess a peace that passes all understanding. There are many Jesus counterfeits being proclaimed today. Make sure you don't get fooled by the false promises of the many phony fake news versions of Jesus. In his first coming, the Bible says, Jesus came to seek and to save that which was lost. In his second coming, he will be his judge. My plea to you this morning is if you're unsaved, make sure you're saved before you stand before him. Accept the real Jesus who brings peace between you and God. Accept the real Jesus today as your Savior. Amen. We're going to sing a, a hymn now. Uh, the hymn.